Greetings, friends, and welcome to Courageous Church Online. We always like to start by welcoming all of our first-time watchers and guests. Thank you so much for joining us today. In the next few moments that we have together, we're going to sing and worship, and then we're going to continue in our brand new series here at Courageous Church called Renewal. If you have any questions about our church or any prayer requests today, please feel free to use the comment section to let us know. You can send us a direct message as well at info at courageouschurch.com. We are a people that are passionate about prayer and we'd absolutely love to pray with you. If it's your first time watching with us, we'd also like to encourage you to fill out a digital connect card to let us know how we can best serve you and help you get connected while at Courageous Church. You can do that right from our website, courageouschurch.com slash connect, and we'd love to hear from you. Join me now as we open with a word of prayer before we go into a time of worship. Father, thank you so much for the renewal that you're bringing about in our lives. God, you make all things new. And today, Lord God, we ask that you would come and do a new thing in our heart and lives. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And the church said amen and amen. Let's worship together. Never 
all, it's great to be with you today to share a message that I absolutely believe is going to encourage you to look to God to bring about a great renewal in your life. Today we're continuing our new series here at Courageous Church called Renewal. And it is our hope that you will find God stirring your soul for the new things that he absolutely wants to do in your life in 2021 and beyond. To begin, Jesus makes a pretty bold statement from his throne at the right hand of the Father in Revelation 21.5 saying, Behold, I am making all things new. Beloved, I believe Jesus wants to do new things in your life. As I said last week, for some of you out there, this language regarding new things might sound familiar to you, and for some of you, the idea that God wants to be at work in the midst of your life might actually challenge you. We also see God's great desire for this to happen, reinforced by what the Apostle Paul says to his church in 2 Corinthians 5.17, saying, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Friends, Jesus wants all things to become new in our lives. And this means that old things, including habits and ways of thinking, must pass away, meaning they need to change. For many of us who have been following Jesus for a while, this invitation is to reset, rediscover, refresh, and renew our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And throughout this series, we're going to look at how we can do exactly that. Today, I want to look at two particular ways that I believe God brings about new things in our life in a message that I'm calling First Things First. I want to begin with a rather emphatic statement, and here it is. God wants you to keep first things first first in your life. Can I repeat that today? God wants you to keep first things first in your life. By first things, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the most important things or things that should be primary in your relationship with God. The truth is there are many things vying for our devotion and our affection today, from social media, the news, and entertainment, to email, notifications, and text messages from well-meaning friends and co-workers. Let's face it, we live in a crowded space, and our lives have become crowded spaces. They have become overstuffed with activities and things that often become primary in our lives. In other words, they end up occupying the driver's seat when in fact they belong well in the back seat, if you know what I mean. Some of these things and activities are obviously good and necessary. Some of them not so much, but all too often and easily our lives become driven by influences that rob us from the kind of life God wants us to have in him. Jesus, aware of our tendency to look for life in all of the wrong places, says this to us in John chapter 10 verses 7 through 11. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. Now, before we can understand what Jesus is alluding to here, it's important to note that in verse 4, Jesus says that a shepherd's sheep know the voice of their shepherd and follow him. In verse 5, he goes on to say that the sheep will not follow the voice of strangers, but flee from them, for they don't even recognize the stranger's voice. So right off the bat, Jesus sets up this great contrast between the shepherd and what he calls strangers or thieves. To understand what he is getting at, you have to understand the context of the story and what's happening in the backdrop of it. Jesus had literally just healed a blind man. In fact, in chapter 9, it says that the man had been blind since birth. This is a big deal and a major miracle that Jesus performs in a very public place and in a very public manner. Now, after being healed by Jesus, the man is brought to the Pharisees who inquire about how he could now see. And the man tells them it was Jesus who healed them. Did you catch that? You see, the re religious rulers can't accept this. So, they, so they, they get the healed blind man's parents to come and testify about what happened. And the man's parents basically refuse to answer the question because they're so afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue for good. That was the threat. So after that, the Pharisees bring the healed blind man back again to question him. And after prodding him and poking him a second time, 
They get angry with him and finally cast him out. Meanwhile, Jesus finds the man and asks him if he believes Jesus to be the Son of God, and he uses the term the Son of Man. The healed blind man confirms that he does believe that and then worships Jesus. Of course, the Pharisees who are nearby hear this and are outraged. And Jesus rebukes them by calling them the guilty ones, implying that they are actually the ones who are truly spiritually blind. Now, this is the backdrop of what's taken place here immediately before John chapter 10. And Jesus is very aware of the fact that his followers and those that oppose him are now listening. In other words, he has their full attention. And so he tells them a rather pointed story about a shepherd whose sheep know his voice and strangers and thieves whom the sheep neither listen to nor belong to. Now, who do you think the sheep in the story are? And who do you think the strangers and thieves are? It's quite obvious the contrast Jesus has established here. And you can see why the Pharisees despise and hate Jesus. Not only does he call them guilty and imply that they're spiritually blind, he now alludes to them being strangers and thieves. As a result, later in verse 20 of chapter 10, they accuse Jesus of having a demon and being out of his mind. That's how much they can't handle what Jesus has done and said. Now, why is this important to us and how does it actually relate to keeping first things first? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a closer look again at verses 7 through 11. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The thief referenced here is actually not the devil, although it is true that the devil wants to destroy us. The thief or robber referenced here is obviously the religious Pharisee who has no interest in doing anything but taking what doesn't belong to him because that's what thieves do. They steal, of course. They, they take what doesn't belong to them. But Jesus goes on to say that the thieves in this story also kill and destroy, implying that they will put to death and destroy the same sheep they attempt to hijack from the shepherd. In contrast to the thief, Jesus says, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And what is he doing? Jesus is offering the sheep life and life to the full. Some translations like the ESV here say life abundantly, meaning there's a way of life that Jesus comes to bring that is abundant in nature, life that is so full that it literally overflows and spills out all over the place. That's the picture here. And in this sense, we know from the context of the story that it's people like the blind man and Jesus' own disciples, those who actually worship Jesus, who are the sheep that belong to Jesus, the good shepherd. These are the ones Jesus has come to bring his abundant life to. People like you and people like me, just ordinary folks who have been caught up in the story of an extraordinary God. People who once couldn't see and who were blind, but who now can see. Come on, somebody. So why does this matter today and how does it relate to first things? Jesus wants you and I to experience the life that he, is, that he alone has actually come to bring us. That's really what renewal is all about. But there are thieves who want to steal and kill and destroy that which is of God and all that belongs to him. And that includes you. Meaning there exists within our world today what I call life thieves that will attempt to steal you away from a relationship with the life-giving God. Although it may not always be a particular figure or group of people that do this directly, I believe we live in a culture that is indirectly influenced by forces of distraction, destruction, and despair. And I believe it is exactly these kinds of forces from within and from without that will rob you of the life that God wants you to have in Him. That is, if you allow them to. One of the ways life thieves are permitted entry into our lives is through what I call a casual abandonment of keeping first things first. What first things am I referring to? Well, I'm talking about your relationship with God, your good shepherd. As his sheep, he wants you to hear his voice. But we don't always hear the voice of God, do we? Sometimes we get caught up in distraction. As his sheep, he also wants you to follow his lead. But we don't always follow his lead, do we? We, like sheep, often go our own way. 
and our own way leads only to destruction, doesn't it? And as his sheep, he also wants us to know the pasture of his presence. But we don't always sense or feel his presence, do we? And I believe that's because we get caught up in despair, what we typically call loneliness. And why? Why do these things happen to us? I believe it's because we have not kept first things first. Jesus speaking to the church at Ephesus says this in Revelation chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Jesus says you've abandoned the love that you had at first. In other words, you've not kept first things first. Sure, you've endured patiently for my name's sake and have not grown weary in doing so, but you've abandoned your first love. And that's me, Jesus. What Jesus is essentially saying here is that you've allowed your love for him to grow cold because other things have become more important or primary in your life. He might even say to us today, you become so busy and so involved with so many things, you're doing all this important work in my name. You're enduring, and you're fighting the good fight. Yet, you've forgotten what is most important, your first love. Earlier in the Gospels, when asked about what is the most important commandment, Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, your love for God is the most important and primary thing in your life, or at least it should be. It is out of loving God that we also learn how to love other people, and we can't do that second part well until we learn how to do the first well, until we keep first things first. This is why it's so crucial for us. Church, I say all the time that our life as a spiritual community and family is all about Jesus because we want to love Jesus well. We believe that if we learn how to love Jesus well, we can in turn go and love others well. This, my friends, is what it's all about. One of the reasons I think we fall away from loving Jesus the way that we're called to is because we're not prioritizing or doing the things that actually benefit and support our relationship with Jesus. What is Jesus' response in verse 5? Repent, which means to turn around, to change your mind, and do the things that you did at first. So, what things did they do at first? Like the early disciples, the church at Ephesus spent time with Jesus. They communed with him through worship, and they held fast to him in prayer. In this way, their relationship with Christ was made vibrant and strong. I believe that. And they did this because they wanted to, not because they had to. Did you catch that? In the same way that when you're in a relationship with somebody that you love, you spend time with them, because you want to, not because you have to. From this reality, we know that all good and healthy relationships require two things, time and communication. One of the most important and valuable ways that we keep first things first in our relationship with God is by spending time with him through prayer. Prayer is simply communicating with God. It's having a relationship with God through an ongoing conversation with him. Through prayer, we share the intimate details of our heart with God, and God shares the intimate details of his heart with us. And friends, hear me on this, okay? It doesn't have to be complicated. I think one of the main reasons we don't pray is because, number one, we haven't been taught how to, and number two, we actually think it's really difficult. Church, prayer is not intended to be difficult. It can be as natural as breathing. And with a little help and assistance, it can produce marvelous results in your life and relationship with Jesus. Just listen to some of what the Bible says about the importance of prayer. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 says this, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Notice how Jesus says when you pray and not if you pray. In, meaning here that God expects that every one of us should pray. He's created us to. Or how about Matthew 26, verse 41? 
Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray, Jesus says here, because he knows that there are life thieves, as we've talked about, ready to snatch us away and lead us into temptation and evil. Or how about Luke 18, verse 1, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Jesus says right here that we should always pray, not sometimes, not only when we feel like it, come on, not when you finally run out of options and you don't know what else to do, but always. And he says, don't lose heart while doing it. That means to not give up on prayer just because you haven't seen the results that you want to see. Paul echoes Jesus' heart here in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 by saying this, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And then, of course, one of the most famous scriptures on prayer of all time that we've all heard before, James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Isn't that good? Friends, prayer is powerful. And in just a moment, I'm going to walk us through what we're going to be doing together as a church in a special time of focused renewal that we're calling 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. Which leads me to the second way we keep first things first. By prioritizing our relationship with God over food and material things. And we do this by drawing closer to Him through what we call the art or the discipline of fasting. Fasting, biblically speaking, is simply refraining from eating. And there are all sorts of different ways to do this. In the scriptures, we know that Jesus himself fasted. In fact, right before God the Father released him into his public ministry, Jesus was tempted by the devil out in the wilderness while fasting. It says this in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1-3. through 3, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting, get this, 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. We know from the rest of the story that Jesus prevailed in his fasting. And just think about that. Jesus could have given in to the urge to eat, but think about the greater ramifications. Jesus could have fed all the poor and hungry as well. Think about how many stones there were in Israel that he could have easily turned into food for all of those who needed it most. Which tells me that there is actually a greater reality available to us than just eating and consuming food. Which is precisely what fasting does. It opens us up to the reality that God has spiritual food for us that physical food can't even begin to scratch the surface of. We actually hear Jesus touch on this later in his ministry when urged by the disciples to eat something. It says this in John chapter 4, verses 31 through 34. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know anything about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? We didn't know about it. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Wow. Jesus was nourished by his relationship with God the Father. It was his relationship with him and desire to carry out his mission that fed his soul in ways the disciples could not even understand. And in the same way, fasting draws us closer to God by reminding our souls that like Jesus would say to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Did you know that fasting is actually a type of spiritual warfare against ways of thinking that your life actually belongs to you and that you can control its outcome? The truth is you can't. Only God knows what's in store for all of us. But if we're willing to trust him with our lives, we can also trust him that he will sustain us. That's because as a spirit being, we are sustained by his spirit. Yes, our bodies were made to receive food, but that's not all there is to life. Fasting reminds our souls, it recalibrates us into believing that God is actually the giver and sustainer of life. It's him who renews our faith in him to become the provider for our lives and not the other way around. You see, when we go to the grocery store or prepare a meal or deposit our hard-earned money into the bank, we subtly reinforce the idea that we're the ones that actually made it happen. But when we fast, we remember and we remind our souls that it's only by God's hand and grace 
that we can and should depend. Friends, right now, we could all use a renewed reminder that God is the only one who can sustain and provide for our lives. Not politicians, not leaders, not educators, not first responders, not scientists, not even Nobel Peace Prize winners. Come on. Only God and God alone can sustain us. And notice that I said when we fast. You see, we must remember this. Jesus said the same thing about fasting in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. It says this, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Did, but did you notice that? He says, and when you fast, he goes on to say, truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast, he says it again, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And that's a promise. Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast, which means that Jesus expected all of his followers to be like him and to do fasting like he did and to not make it into a big public spectacle to get the attention of other people. No, the goal is the attention of our heavenly father alone. Amen. We see other types and models of fasting in the scriptures as well, including Daniel's fast, which is sometimes referred to as a partial or selective fast. This is based on the fact that Daniel would not eat the king's delicacies Instead, he ate only vegetables and drank only water. You could say that Daniel was the original biblical vegan. There you go for all my vegetarian and vegan friends out there. The point was actually that he would not allow himself to become defiled by what the king of Babylon was offering him. Now, hear me on this. In the same way today, fasting is a sort of resistance against the influences of Babylon in our life. And boy, are there many influences that we contend with. Fasting allows us to separate ourselves for a time and season to come closer to God by becoming more distant to the influences and grip of the world. And please hear my heart on this. Fasting is not about legalism. It's not about shame or guilt or feeling better than someone else because of your food choices. Please don't make fasting into that. Fasting is only about keeping God first in your life. And the same goes for prayer. The end goal of prayer and fasting is not prayer and fasting. The end goal is to be with Jesus, to become like him, and to do what he did. Or as Jesus put it, to abide in the vine and bear much fruit. That's really, church, what we're after in practicing both prayer and fasting. Of course, there are many other models of prayer and fasting that we don't have time to get into today. But we do cover them in our prayer and fasting guide at our website, available to view and download for free. Come on, at CourageousChurch.com slash first things first, which brings us to where we are today, kicking off our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We'd love for you to join us on this journey over the next 21 days of allowing God to renew our first love and draw us closer to him through both prayer and fasting. As I mentioned above, you can download our guide, which will absolutely help you in how to pray over the next 21 days. We've also listed at our website, courageouschurch.com slash first things first, some different kinds of fast and ways that you can do that biblically. Here's my encouragement to you. Pray and ask God to decide what kind of fast you should do and then do it. I can't tell you how many times I sat back and watched other people do what God was calling me to do and I missed out on the blessing of it. And church, we don't want you to miss out on the blessing of what God is going to do at Courageous Church in this season. He's bringing renewal. We believe that. And we want you to be a part of it. So pray and fast with us. You can do it. In the guide, there are actually seven models of prayer that you can choose from each and every day. And here's what we want you to do. Number one, choose each day which model of prayer to use. Number two, set aside a special time and place to pray. That's really important. And number three, start with known models and then try out new ones. We want this time of prayer to be a fun adventure between you and God. And remember, it is supposed to be between you and God, not you and Facebook, not you and Instagram. So keep your pictures and all of your quotes to yourself and do this in secret. And as for fasting, if you can't do a complete partial or selective food fast with us, that's okay. You know what can be just as important? Fasting, social media, and entertainment. In fact, given everything that's been happening over the past couple of weeks, I think we're all overdue for some offline time. Amen? Amen. Hear my heart. If you do nothing else but unplug your phone and unplug 
from social media, you will have greatly strengthened your relationship with God. I promise you that. As a final thought and encouragement, I'll say this. I was able to get away this week just to withdraw and to pray and to disconnect. And I can honestly say how much it has impacted me in a big way. Because I realized how overstuffed and overcommitted I was to things and people, social media, entertainment, and distraction. And this is not the way of Jesus. Friends, God does not want you to live a fruitless and barren life. He does not want you to live a life that's fragmented into pieces. And he doesn't want you to be so distracted and in a hurry all the time like we spoke about last week. Instead, let's be a people that are willing to give God the first of our year as a dedicated offering to him. Let's reset some priorities and allow Jesus to renew some things in us and our thinking. Let's make and keep first things first. Amen? Amen. Maybe you've been watching or listening to this message today and you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. We believe that starts by saying yes to him. Yes, to receive him into your life by faith. And we never want to end our time without giving you the chance to do that. It can be as simple as praying this prayer with me and I'll pray it with you right now. It goes like this. Jesus, Savior, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from all the things that have kept me bound. I believe and confess that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on that cross and that God raised you to life again. Jesus, I ask that you would come now and give me a new life of freedom and hope in you. Make me your church your favorite dwelling place. Come fill me with your Holy Spirit and make all things new. And if you just prayed that with us, we want to know about your decision. For those that said yes to Jesus for the first time, we want to tell you welcome to the family of God. Welcome to his great party that he's throwing in your honor right now. We'd love for you to let us know. You can go to CourageousChurch.com and fill out a digital connect card. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to stand with you. We'd love to equip you and help you take some next steps in your faith. We'd also love to send you a Bible, and we believe that will absolutely help you in your new faith journey. For those of you that live here in the Salt Lake Valley or close to it, we're currently gathering in person at our new building at 10702 South, 300 West in South Jordan on Sundays at 5 p.m., and we'd love for you to come out and join us in person. We also have prayer nights on Tuesdays at 7. That's every Tuesday at 7, as well as our next night of worship on January 19th. If you're interested in any of that, you can go to our website, CourageousChurch.com, to get all the details. And lastly, if Courageous Church is your home church, we want to remind you and encourage you to honor God with your giving. Your generosity blesses the heart of God, and it enables and empowers us to reach many with the hope, healing, courage, and life of Jesus. It allows us to advance his good mission and his good gospel for all the people of Salt Lake City, the Mountain West, and beyond. And if you want to be a part of that effort, you want to be a part of what God's doing with this church to make a huge difference, just go ahead and use one of the links that we've posted right there in the comment section, or head on over to CourageousChurch.com slash giving to give online. Church, we love you. You are God's masterpiece. Behold, he is making all things new. So be strong and courageous. We'll see you soon.